thanks very much, everyone. And I'll just hand you over to the moderator for today now. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, our moderator is having challenges. I believe um, she got kicked out, but she's trying to join in the session. Uh, but I'll just kick us off um, and she'll join us shortly. So um, welcome to today's session of the Global South Women's Forum 2020. Uh, my name is Nicole Maloba, and um, I will be stepping in briefly for our moderator, who is uh, Memory Kachambwa. So just to start us off um, with a quote uh, based on what we're about to engage with and based on this uh, lovely space, which we've been able to be a part of um, with the Global South um, Feminist Forum, which is um, the words of Wangari Mathai, which is, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that you can't do it alone. It's teamwork. When you do it alone, you run the risk that when you are no longer there, nobody else will do it. So these are the words of Wang, the late Wangari Madai, who was the first African woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. As we engage in this space, um, we're very excited to be able to be in a powerful position because this is a space which brings around feminists um, from all over the global south region but also those from uh, developing nations but we come together for the purpose of knowledge generation movement building and with our key focus areas of disrupting feminist um, economies so um, welcome once again to our session today at femnet which is being hosted by femnet and we will be engaging with our trade policy. So the topic which we will be engaging with is um, feminist engagements with trade policy. Uh, what we'll be engaging with here is a feminist perspective on gender equality and trade. Some of our um, great uh, speakers we're having today include Dr. Michelle Maziwisa, um, Fatima Keleha and Labila Musoke. You'll notice um, as they engage us more in this topic and conversations with feminist trade policy, we'll have um, representations from the southern part of Africa, we'll have representation from the western part of Africa, as well as the eastern part of Africa, and then bring it all down with a general um, feel from central and north as well. So without any further delays, um, I'll now call on our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Michelle. Uh, she will be engaging us with gender and trade. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Hi, Nicole. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us from different parts of the world. I'm going to be speaking on gender and trade, first providing um, some context and then going on to some of the intersections between gender and trade. So I'll address four main questions. What is international trade? How do women interact with trade? How does trade affect women differently from men? And what are the entry points for women's organizations? Can you just confirm if my, my audio is loud enough? Uh, Michelle, uh, if you can speak it much louder, you're a bit faint. We can hear you, okay. but 
it should be great if we can speak louder. All right, thank you so much, Memory. Um, I will just, okay. I'll get straight into the presentation. Um, I think it must be a bit louder now. So the first question that I will look at, if you may please go on to the next slide, is what is international trade? International trade is the exchange of goods and services across borders. It is not a new phenomenon, but it has existed for centuries. The idea is that countries should specialize in producing and trading those goods that they're good at producing and trading. In other words, those goods where they have a comparative advantage. The predominant approach in international trade is that trade should not be hampered by government. Regulations regarding tariffs, quotas, subsidies, and technical barriers to trade are supposed to be limited in order to allow free trade, what is also called trade liberalization. Although countries negotiate trade rules, anyone can engage in trade. A trade occurs within a multilateral trading system, which is the system built around the World Trade Organization that regulates global trade through a range of international agreements based on principles of non-discrimination, namely national treatment and most favored nation treatment. WTO rules are binding on member states, but they allow for bilateral and regional trade agreements, provided these do not conflict with the WTO agreement. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which Fatima will discuss, is an example of a regional trade agreement. The second question is how do women interact with trade? And I've divided this into four subsectors, which is women in value chains, women as traders, women as consumers, and women as citizens. So first looking at women in global trade value chains. One of the challenges with the current trading system is that it takes a gender neutral approach, which is problematic. Trade liberalization coupled with systemic occupational discrimination presents major challenges for women. Export-oriented sectors such as agriculture and textiles, for example, are highly dependent on low-cost labor, which exacerbates existing inequalities between men and women. While promoting economic growth through employment opportunities for women, um, it tends to be exploitative. It banks on women as suppliers of cheap labor. And work in these sectors tends to be precarious as it is low skilled, it is informal, seasonal. It tends to have low wages and is excluded from social protections due, due to its informal nature and may soon be replaced by robots as the nature of work is changing and evolving. In other sectors such as mining, women tend to hold low skilled jobs such as cleaning and office support and they face barriers to entering managerial positions. All these factors contribute to the wide wage gap between men and women in the mining sector. For example, Anglo-Americans 2018 report noted a median wage gap of 41.2% between men and women at its UK office. Next, looking at women as traders. Persistent structural inequalities prevent women-owned informal businesses and small and medium enterprises from accessing trade finance, that is credit. For example, customary rules relating to land ownership, especially in rural areas in Africa, prevent women from owning land which can be used as collateral. Further, mainstream credit facilities are not geared towards women informal traders. And further, although competition can promote efficiency and creativity, women and men owned SMEs tend to struggle to compete with imported goods, especially in sectors such as agriculture, which tends to be heavily subsidized in the global north. When we look at women as citizens, we find that regulating trade policy at the regional or global level means that there is less policy space to regulate at the national level. And this means governments have reduced policy space to address domestic policies on economic development and gender equality. Reduced tariffs mean reduced government revenue. And evidence has shown 
that fiscal austerity usually results in spending cuts in public services that women rely on more than men, such as sexual and reproductive health, as well as childcare. Further, when customs duties are removed, governments often seek alternative domestic tax, <clears throat> domestic tax revenues, such as value added tax, which has disproportionate effects on women. For example, increased VAT on labor saving appliances can cause women to be unable to buy such appliances and instead perform work manually, using up their productive time and labor. Additionally, Women's lower income and consumption patterns creates the potential for women to bear a higher VAT burden than men. And when we look at women as consumers, women may benefit from trade because it promotes competition and efficiency, which means they can access goods at a lower price. If you consider urban women, they may benefit from cheaper foodstuffs. But on the, on the reverse, you'll find that women producers, for example, rural women, may actually face the opposite, finding that the prices that they have to compete with are much lower than their cost of production. Looking at um, the third question on how does trade affect women differently? So specific sectors are affected differently. Um, I've just been speaking on how women are affected generally. And now if we look specifically at the agriculture sector and if we look at intellectual property rights, we'll find that women are affected differently from men. According to the World Economic Forum, women grow 70% of Africa's food, but have few land rights. Agricultural production is important because it affects not only income, but also food security. And we know that income facilitates women's autonomy and decision-making, as well as power dynamics within the home. Women tend to provide low-cost labor while men control the proceeds in general. And we find, as I mentioned earlier, that subsidized imports make it difficult for local producers to compete and may force them out of the, out of the market. And this may have severe impacts for women, especially in women-dominated agricultural sectors. We also see that generally trade policy tends to focus on cash crops to the benefit of men because men dominate in this area and control or tend to control both production and income. While women tend not to have access to land, they don't have access to credit, storage facilities, training, technology, and market information. And they may also not have access to the established networks that their male counterparts may have. While 80% of women work in agriculture, less than 10% receive credit granted to small farmers. And in relation to intellectual property, patents protect valuable intellectual property, but high costs for accessing products can prevent access to medication and seeds, causing women's care burden to increase and risking food security. Patenting has also taken away women's role as custodians of seed, especially in Africa. It has taken away seed from women's hands and given it to corporations. And finally, on the fourth point, looking at entry points, some of the entry points for women's organizations include training of women and governments, human rights-based advocacy, summarizing key aspects of trade instruments into user-friendly flyers, pamphlets, or posters and translation of key messages on trade related issues to make these issues accessible to the women that need them the most. And this is especially important in light of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And I'll leave it here as Fatima will continue on this. Thank you so much. Back to you, Nicole. Thank you for that. Um introduction to gender and trade, Michelle. I'll now hand it over back to Memory, who can then hand it over to Fatima. Memory? Um, thanks. All right, thanks so much, Nicole, and Paul. Yes, Nicole, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Hello, hi, Nicole. Can you hear me? Yes, this is way. This is better. Yes, this is better. Wow. Yeah. I think my network is being very difficult. 
All right. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, whilst I, I still have the bandwidth, let me straight, uh, just introduce uh, Fatima Keller. Uh, it's been made, but also a lot of work on the African continent and it also in other regions. Uh, Fatima uh, will take us through the Africa free continent and the gender issues and the gender implications. So Fatima, over to you. Uh, sorry, I can't do an elaborate introduction because of my bandwidth, but I'll also give you uh, seven to eight. Hello? I think I can start now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Yes. Fatima. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Memory. No elaborate <laughs> introductions needed at all. Um, preferred not actually. So thank you. Um, yeah. And thank you so much, Michelle, for that excellent introduction, which has allowed me to segue immediately into the African um, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And so the first thing I want to do is to give you a background on what that is um, and some questions around that as well. And uh, then we want to see what essentially that means for, for Africa's women and what the key feminist questions are. And I, I only have seven minutes, so I'll do my best to get through it within that time. So um, as Michelle said, it's a regional trade agreement and they're aiming for all 55 African Union um, nations to be part of that. So if that was to happen, it would be the largest free trade area in the world. So far, 54 have actually signed up with only Eritrea still abstaining. Um, at the moment, Africa is the least integrated region in the world. Uh, Intra-African, intracontinental trade only accounts for 15% of all African trade. So fundamentally, this uh, agreement is looking to fast track um, that percentage up the scale quite quickly. And what that means is the liberalization time frame is extremely rapid. Members of the uh, CFTA will be expected to remove tariffs from 90% of goods. So this is free access to commodities, goods and services um, within a time frame of seven years if you are not, uh, if, if you are not a, a least developed country and 10 years if you are. And then within that, uh, the, the following 10%, there are a number of goods that will be considered sensitive. So you can then essentially liberalize them at a slower rate. Um, and there will be a percentage of goods that will also be exempt. Um, but 90% is very high. And so we are looking essentially at a decade for all African countries to liberalize these goods. Um, and there are some question marks around this, which we will come to in a second. Now, the thing about the CFTA, the African CFTA, is that it is being hailed as the start of the Pan-African dream. You know, and I don't have enough time to go to really unpack what that means from an African, from a Pan-African feminist positioning today. But um, we have to ask ourselves the key question around this in terms of what kind of a policy of solidarity exists within this agreement. We know that trade liberalization is about competition fundamentally. And as Michelle pointed out, it's about comparative advantage. So the idea is um, each country will find the specific area of goods and services that they are good at. And so any inequalities that exist between countries will eventually be ironed out as each country finds its comparative advantage. But it is still a competitive process. And within the liberalization time frame, particularly the one that's being proposed here, we could be looking at quite intense shocks that come to various sectors, um, regardless of the fact that this is an internal project. So the fact that we are not doing this with actors outside of the continent um, does not take away from the fact that we are still in a competitive process with each other. And even though the language of collaboration is being used um, within the agreement, so far there is no reference to um, the position of solidarity. And this is particularly pertinent because as much as it is an internal project, there will still be extra continental engagement with the project. So what that means is other countries have vested interests in this project as well. So some of our largest um, corporations on the continent have 
huge shareholder power outside of the continent. This will, this will essentially open up the continent for them. And when it comes to competition, indigenous private sector, for example, may not be able to compete on the same levels. I mean, it's very likely that they won't. And so a lot of questions around what we mean by Pan-Africanism needs to follow on the back of this. We cannot just assume that because we are integrating as a continent, which is part of the Pan-African dream, yes, that this is the mode that it should follow. Um, and so for women in particular, there will be various impacts at various levels. So if we could go to the next slide, we can get into that, please, Nicole. Right, so like with any trade liberalization process, the CFTA will have impacts on women at the micro as well as the macro level. So at the macro level, we will see some sectors contracting and job losses. And the reason why is because you will see other countries maybe being able to compete more effectively by sending their goods in. Um, you will also see an expansion of some sectors as a country then invests quite heavily in order to try and find its comparative advantage. But within all of that, women's lives and the lives of men will be shifting quite fundamentally. Um, and there will be job losses, as well as potentially the creation of new jobs. But then the question mark over, you know, uh, gendered segregation of labor still lies within that. Um, at the micro level, you know, the, the household income will also be impacted. So those women who lose their livelihoods will also lose power within the household framework. Those who increase their livelihoods may have an increased uh, access to, to not just goods and services more broadly, but also negotiating power. However, again, those equations are not automatic. What we do know is that the process itself will create quite substantial eruptions. So apart from women's livelihoods being impacted, we are also looking at essential public services. Um, as has already been mentioned by Michelle, you know, the loss of tariff revenue will be quite critical in the coming years for many countries. And what this then means for public services that are already underfunded needs to be looked at. In its preamble, the CFTA does note the importance of gender equality. Uh, as being important to international trade and economic, de economic development, but it doesn't actually go much further than that. Um, and there are key sectors that are planned for expansion under the CFTA that are very pertinent to women. So agriculture being the most obvious one. Um, fundamentally, the CFTA is being seen as the route by which the C Africa will actually industrialize. So we're also looking at potentially an increase in manufacturing and services. Um, but as Michelle again also noted, you know, we are going into uh, an age of automation. So how aligned in some ways um, th th this agreement is with that and what it means for the livelihoods of women more broadly is a question that again, we need to ask. Next slide, please, Nicole. And this brings us actually to what our main questions are as feminists, um, as African feminists specifically for this, for this agreement. The first is regarding women in the informal sector. So how will the CFTA genuinely incentivize but also protect women who make up the majority of this sector and in particular informal cross-border traders? So we know that informal cross-border traders, many of them are women across the continent, and we know that there is an opportunity within this for them to be able to trade more safely. But we need to see what that will actually mean in terms of the provisions that are made and also the investments that are made in the women themselves and not necessarily just the various surroundings surrounding areas um, that, that they will be part of. Another aspect of this we have to ask more critically is what kind of a focus is being put on women as traders within the CFTA. The majority of research that has come out so far supporting the CFTA from a gender perspective has looked at women as traders. And this really puts the onus of sort of entrepreneuring yourself out of poverty on women in the continent. And actually what we really need to be looking at more critically is the issue of labor, which again, Michelle has mentioned, um, and what this means in terms of as being a source of comparative advantage. 
So women's cheap labor is a source of comparative advantage we have seen in trade liberalization agreements across the world. Um, but the question is what provisions are being put into place to ensure that their labor is not exploited and that the work being created is decent and dignified. The World Bank in a report back in August claimed that women's wages will rise as a result of this. And that sounds great, but we have to understand what the benchmarks are there and they haven't put any of those forward. So you could have an increase in wages, it's very true. But if those wages are still not able to provide a decent standard of living, then they do become meaningless and they can actually entrench inequalities, particularly if segregated labor becomes the norm upon which that comparative advantage is based. Um, Export processing zones are likely to follow on the back of this. We already have these in Africa, but of course the agreement itself makes uh, reference to special economic arrangements, which is essentially code to export processing zones. And as we know, export processing zones um, are spaces within which national uh, legal regulations regarding labor are often absent and legal, can be legally absent. So essentially you do not have to provide the same sort of decent and dignified frameworks that you would have outside of those spaces. The other issue is access to essential and gender responsive services. So how will these services that women need be funded when revenues drops as tariffs are removed? We've talked about VAT so far, but actually one of the key questions we have to ask is will this potentially lead to increased privatization that commodifies those public goods and essential services? We know already that public private partnerships are increasing on the continent in spaces such as health, education, and when tariffs drop and when the public purse shrinks, the opportunity to engage with private actors is often jumped at um, for a variety of different reasons, and not just monetary, but also a fallacy around the idea of efficiency. We have to monitor this. You know, this could be the beginning of a fast tracking of privatization of goods and services that actually have yet to be even properly born within the continent at the moment in terms of accessibility for all. The next question is regarding rural livelihoods, agricultural industrialization and local food systems. So will the CFTA be any different from those trade initiatives that prioritize those high value male dominated agricultural commodities that Michelle mentioned, ultimately crowding out women and which also have been shown to push them off their land? The second aspect of this question is how will this impact local food systems and food sovereignty in particular? So the agro-industrial framework that is essentially leading within the vision of the CFTA aims to increase food security, but we have actually no concrete evidence to show that food security is genuinely improved as a result of agro-industrialization policies. Localized food systems, which in times of crisis, such as this pandemic, are often far more reliable, um, are likely to be undermined as a result of that entire process. So alternatives to the agro-industrial paradigm, such as agroecology, um, which is something that various actors on the continent are exploring and indeed is being explored even more in the global north because uh, we have seen how actually detrimental to both the environment and to food prices agro-industrialization agro has been. Um, these could be nipped in the bud again before they've even had a chance to fly. And finally, um, protection from the inevitable adjustment costs. So the way trade liberalization frames the changes that occur within a rapid space of time, such as loss of jobs, they call this adjustment and they're called adjustment costs. But these costs are felt deeply at the personal level, at the at the household level in terms of people's lives. So in countries where social safety nets are not the norm, what economic packages are being designed to ensure that the continent's women are no not gonna be further impoverished through um, a loss of livelihoods that will result in some sectors as countries readjust to the effects of liberalization. So fundamentally, I will end with just saying, while the opportunities are being fully explored by organizations such as UNECA, such as um, UN Women, in fact, these 
critical questions around some of the detrimental impacts have yet to actually be answered. And we cannot simply just assume that there will be collateral damage in terms of people's lives over the next 10 years in order to get us to a place of development. From a feminist position, I will argue that it's completely and utterly unacceptable. And indeed, the very idea that there is no alternative pathway is defeatist and quite frankly, lacks vision. So we have to continue asking these questions as feminists of this uh, continental free trade agreement. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Fatima. I mean, as you ended, I got so fired up on how, why we need to have a lot of solidarity in terms of really pushing um, this agenda and I mean the feminist angle in terms of the CFTA I think what is being presented out there is completely different from the realities and the depth of the analysis that you have presented thank you so much I also want to say that um, you've also done a, a very very insightful paper I'll ask Nicole to to share the link, which also looks into the CFTA from a feminist uh, perspective. And I think this is the kind of um, narrative that we should be pushing, and we should also um, the, uh, the UNECA space, but also a solidarity from our feminist economists from other regions as well. Thank you for, for really enlightening up. I really like what you said in that in the symbol of the uh, CFTA, it's not the importance of gender equality for the importance of economic development, but it goes no further. I certainly see how these instruments are being used in a very um, instrumental way, which does not really pay everyone. But we know that when you really go um, start looking at the entry cases, it's also just another trade liberalization tool of this neoliberal uh, economic system that we need. Hi, Memory. Sorry, we lost you. I think we've lost memory. Um, as we're still waiting um, for Memory to join us again, uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for that introduction to the African Continental Free Trade Area, Fatima. Uh, without any further ado, I'll now call on Labila to take us to the next presentation, which will be on a case study of Uganda. I'm back. Okay, no worries, memory. Uh, Labila, over to you. Welcome back, memory. Uh, Nicole, uh, Labila. Okay, great. If you can take over, because it's just difficult today. <laughs> Sorry, memory. <laughs> Good afternoon, sister. This is uh, such a great timing to talk about. Can everyone hear me? Hello. Hello. Hello, Bila. Uh, we can hear you, but um, your network is a bit uh, yes. slow. So maybe I could just yeah, I could just recommend maybe turn off your video so that we can get you clearer if the video is yeah is affecting the network. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, once again, good afternoon. Thanks and power to us all to have such a this thinking about what the next day will be like. I'll go uh, taking it from my my sisters about um I situate the the topic or the theme of uh, gender and trade into a case study 
be zeroing it down to women or our sisters that are usually go unseen and hard and those are street vendors uh, taking it to, to Uganda. Uh, globally, we see that 89% uh, of, of women are engaged in informal in sectors. And the recent study for the UN women estimates about 2 billion workers globally are informally employed and not covered by social protection or employment benefits. And that's why this is what informs the case side of looking at the street vendors. Um, to, to bring it clearer to, to, to poor, not going to the African cities, that those uh, traders who come to the streets, they don't have a permanent address, they don't have a permanent structure, but they vend up um, quick merchandise like clothes, merchandise or seasonings, tomatoes or um, onions, just in rush hours of the day just to catch their customers. And much of that trade is by chance. So, uh, when 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 we look at the the gender aspects into the into such trade, we come up to questions of who are these women and why do we have to make them visible? Why is their visibility important at such a critical time when when capitalists are talking about? urbanization, modernization of these cities and expanding cities to look like the state of art in uh, New York City or the Paris that we've, we all admire. But what does it mean for such women that are going to be displayed uh, when we take on such capitalistic agendas? Uh, so at that moment, we also look at the power that comes uh, taking the case study for Uganda, we have the Kampala Capital City Authority that has the mandate to regulate whatever businesses within the capital. Uh, so what these authorities do is Sorry, your 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 voice is very much breaking, so I can't do the interpreter sign language interpreter. Can you repeat once again? Oh, sorry. Uh, first, first I talked about the um, why 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 the case study of street vendors. And we talk about them because they're, they're usually invisible, yet they contribute so much to the capital revenue of the nation. And we're using Uganda as a case study, as a representative of all African cities that have traders that have no addresses and permanent structures that go on vending uh, and engaging in sale of food, uh, clothes, merchandise, but remain invisible. And also, we have the when the, the capitalistic agenda of expanding cities and modernizing these cities. With land uh, that was formerly for, uh, for agriculture where um, women are predominantly into, into land, agricultural land to cities putting up high scrapers and uh, buildings. So what does it mean for that woman who is to depend on, um, on that piece of past? is the compensation is so unfair to these women and they usually have so that sorry uh, labila we're really we're losing you sorry huh. labila okay. are you still with us because our uh, connection is very very yeah. slow so that's the region. Welcome to Africa. Oh, 
our voice yeah. and sorry for that yeah um i think we've we've lost i don't know if she's still with us um labila yes please i'm here yes we lost you a bit um if you could um come back and talk to us about um the uh, street vendors um policies in informal and irregular activities yes thank you that's where we lost okay. you yeah yes thank you for the but sorry for the connection, but I'm one of one of the hottest spots in Kampala where I can get the best internet. But I was talking about globalization and how it has affected uh, street vendors. When we talk about globalization, they come with their agendas of um, expanding the cities, um, building up high scrapers, and this comes with land grabbing or land conversion. What does this mean for, for the women? Oh, where does it leave women if you are to be integrated? It means that these women who initially didn't have titles to the land, they will not be compensated, that's why. So they fall out of business because they cannot grow their crops. Then uh they turn to the informal sector for survival i'm sorry you don't get it yes they turn to the informal sector for survival so um these women are located uh, and all these informal sectors all the the, the the market vending is socially less respected so it also brings in that gender gender aspect where the They are also less respected, and also women also turn to to unpaid care work, which also translates into uh, extra activities or responsibilities for the woman. Uh, yet the man continues to venture into more paying well jobs. Uh, the report for the UN Secretary General on economic empowerment talks about redistribution of these resources. So, uh, yes. Labila. Next slide with the images. Yes, I've already shared. Uh, when when I don't see. Can everyone else see that I've shared? I've gone to a different slide. When you yes. Yeah. Images, on my end. Yeah, on my end, I have. Hey, Labila, you're really breaking. Can you hear me? Them carrying. Yes, 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 I can. can see. Oh, no, no, Labila, I, the internet was breaking. Okay, I uh, just go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, I can. Uh, these are illustrations of the humiliation and harassment of these street vendors by the law enforcement officers. And what you see in color, the, the headlines, those, those are the headlines from the newspapers, local newspapers, and how they've been capturing all these things. At one moment in 2017, we see a police or um, a law enforcement officer running up after a vendor for illegally selling their merchandise across the street. And the vendor with so much fright uh, falls into an open drainage and she loses her life instantly. Uh, the, the image with a green, green color, we're seeing a gentleman, quite of a young age, beating up an old woman of about 40 years plus. But because he's a man, he's um, in a police uniform, so he has this power over, over her. 
and he thinks she doesn't have any contribution to the economy. And all these other women, those are images of a few women who are also resisting and trying to find a living through the streets. So when we talk about gender and trade, what are we talking about? How, how are these um, policies formulated at the authority level? And who sits at that table? When, when you look at the Kampala City Authority, so they cannot even relate to the lived experiences of women to see, yes, if we need Kampala to expand, to look more like the first world cities, we can do this. So what well, moving forward, uh, what are the pathways to have a just and gender equality tomorrow? And this is the context of trade. How can we trade better? How can we have women's rights protected? One, we... I, we pro I propose organizing and this uh, organizing power within the um, women street vendors. At the moment, I can recall that there's, uh, there's some organizations within about four markets in the capital that women have come together and we provide paralegal services. We equip, equip them with, um, with um, their rights, how to, to demand for their rights. And this has resulted in two, as an outcome, we've seen that uh, the Kampala City Authority has come up with an ordinance for these um, uh, street vendors, where they will have those uniforms, they will have um, identifying uniforms of green, yellow, blue, just identify them so for these law enforcement officers not to attack them uh, inhumanly. Then the other suggestion is we, uh, the government has to look at redistribution of social resources and provide direct credit to these women street vendors. When, uh, and, and this is sort of um, a social protection and cushioning them from any shops and expanding their, their um, funds on how to exist more with better trade and better income. Also, formulation of welfare policies should take place into, into account uh, the gender disparities that capture uh, women street vendors' lived experiences. At this, we propose at the um, authority level that each market should have a nursing place. Each market should have uh, a nurse or a, a, a health officer on 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 duty at all times and also through the uganda law society we've also instituted desks for legal pro bono work where women face uh, sexual harassment issues or they come in conflict with the law they can easily come uh, for legal advice and services free of charge then there is also there's need to expand safety nets for labor and economic policies to the informal sector. Uh, what, what the government has to know and the policymakers have to appreciate at the moment that much as they call it the informal sector, these women contribute heavily to the national revenue and they contribute uh, to the general GDP of a country through providing care at home, providing uh, selling their merchandise and also from the budget framework they're also, they're also paying taxes and they're also paying taxes to in all these forums so i i seek to leave this discussion at this moment and invite any questions in the context of that case study and the broader discussions at hand thank you Thank you for that, Labila. Uh, memory, are you still able to? Thank that? you so much, Labila. <laughs> yes, go ahead, uh, Memory. Yes, Nicole. Um, my co my co moderator, Nicole. I think today the connection. Yes. Um, yes. 
all our just saying today to offer the moderation to you. I think internet is really is tired because it's discussing one of the so you Nicole? Yes, uh, no, no worries, Mary. Um, no worries at all. So I think um, we'll now, apologies again for the challenges in connection. As you can see this year, globally, we had to, you know, come together virtually and this is how we had to make it happen. And of course, the challenges is that um, in most African countries, internet connection is a privilege. So it's it's not the best, even if we get it, it's not the best connection. So apologies once more, please bear with us. Um, we'll be happy to share the PowerPoint presentation with you all after this session, um, which will be shared um, by the organizers uh, back to you. So um, without wasting any time, we'd just like to take um, a few questions which I saw came in um, on the chat. And these questions are open to, um, all facilitators, uh, but there was one specific one for Fatima, um, and the question was on was on the CFTA. So Fatima, uh, there's been much enthusiasm about the agreement in the EU because it provides European TNCs a single market and fewer transitional costs. Can you speak to that? Yes. That's a yes, I. Yes, I can. And thank you very much, Nilanjana, for uh, posting that question up, which allows me to expand a little bit in one area, but I'll try and do so as quickly as possible. So the question of transnational corporations um, uh, out, from outside of the, the continent is something that I, I hit on very briefly. Uh, and it's a, it's a very um, stark reality that, again, needs to be looked at in more detail. Essentially, we know that transnational corporations have subsidiaries on our continent. They have subsidiaries everywhere. Um, there's a fantastic report, actually, from 2013 or 14, I can't remember, by ActionAid that looked at uh, Zambian Sugar, which is a subsidiary of British Associated Foods, and the tax um, of evasions that had occurred within the country uh, as a result of the power relationship that was essentially at play, but also as a result of how um, complicated and adept tax evasion has become in recent years and how it is transnational corporations that know how to do that better than anyone. So there's just this, there's a, one fundamental thing we need to understand about this issue, and it's that of power. So even as the CFTA is about to kick off with the aim of solidifying our borders, because this, if we are talking about it from a pan-African perspective, we are supposed to be solidifying our borders, making ourselves stronger as a continent so that we will not be in powerless relationships in the future, in powerless trading relationships in particular in the future. That's the idea. But first of all, you need a lot of money to get this agreement off the ground. Huge infrastructural development needs to happen, should have happened already, to be perfectly honest, before the liberalization started in order to minimize damage. Um, in order to compete, countries are going to be soliciting finance. They're also going to be soliciting foreign direct investment, and they will be making offers to transnational corporations as well towards that end. This could lead to a variety of different tax breaks and in inverted commas, um, which again end up decreasing the public purse. But most importantly, it comes back and again to this issue of power in terms of what that then means for those on the continent, indigenous private sector on the continent and citizens on the continent who are going to be the workers and traders part of the, as a part of this um, agreement. They are not in a position to compete with these transnational corporations, not at the moment, but the liberalization is going to start happening from January of 2021 regardless of that. So there's a real question here of whether or not um, the cart has been put before the horse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think that's a, a Britishism to a certain extent, but maybe running before you can walk. The idea that we're going to start liberalizing so quickly before any of these conversations have genuinely been had between countries, 
within countries um, is critical. And just as a final note, I think it's really important coming back to this issue of a policy of solidarity to note that there is huge disparity between our countries in terms of wealth. Three countries provide over 50% of the GDP, the continental GDP, that's South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt. We have the majority of least developed countries in the world, in our continent. This is a hugely unequal playing field upon which this uh, agreement will be kicking itself off. And within all of that statistic are real lives, real lives, real women who are going to bear the brunt of, of this situation. And so we have to ask these questions. So thank you very much for that question. Um, yeah, I think it's a very important one. Uh, thank you so much for that, Fatima. Um... I'll now go on to another question which came in and this is for this is for uh, Michelle and Muchas gracias. Uh, Ahora vamos a hacer otra pregunta. Sorry. Um is the interpreter coming in? Oh, I think that was an error. Um this question is for Michelle. Um and Michelle, there was a question just, you know, as, as we've been engaging and how you gave us such a great introduction to gender and trade, there was a key question of why is it that women are losing out on being part of trade policies and the decisions that affect them? Um, wh why is it that we're on the losing end? And I think also as we engage further, of course, we'd like to know more of how can we, you know, how can women... Um, what are some of the opportunities for feminist and social justice acti activists engage with this issue? But first, I'll just take it to what is the gap? Like, what's the gap? Because sometimes we can't address our solutions without having to identify what the gap is and what the problem is. So why are women left behind when it comes to trade policies? Michelle, over to you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, those are great questions. And I think the co-presenters have presented uh, great sessions as well before me. I mean, uh, great presentations. Um, I'll start with your second question on why women are excluded. Um, I think that question could apply to any area of life, really. And I think one of the main challenges is that there are systemic issues and structural issues that have always put women at the um, at the back benches or at the back burners, which have not been addressed and which the trading system has neglected. As I mentioned at the start of my um, presentation, the trading system takes, or rather the, the World Trade Organization um, in its agreements and declarations mentions women but nominally, but the rest of the agreements deal with women in a gender blind, um, or they take a gender blind perspective. So the challenge with that is there's no consideration that is given to how the different agreements actually affect women differently from men. Everything is taken as being neutral. So that's one of the, one of the challenges. The second challenge is that women are historically um, at a disadvantaged position because women have been fighting for equality in almost every area of life. And the economic areas have, been, have not been um, excluded from that fight. In the African context, we still find that a lot, of, um, a lot of households find economic issues to be the domain of the man of the house or, or the husband, where women don't really have a voice to speak out. Um, and I'm speaking in terms of basic household items, not even going beyond to international trade um, elements. So in terms of access to the finances that are used within the home, men tend to earn higher incomes, men tend to hold the purse. And when it comes now to engaging on the international sphere, there's this um, almost ingrained assumption or stereotype that men are more capable to participate in that area. And I think, some of the factors that contribute to that is that trading and especially trading across borders tends to be seen as highly technical and complicated. And it comes uh, with risks for personal safety. If you think of um, cross-border trade that Fatima mentioned, women have to think twice before participating in cross-border trade because they're, they're at risk 
um, of their, their physical bodies are at risk of being attacked, they're at risk, at risk of sexual violence, they're at risk of um, bribery and being forced to engage in sexual acts. And so some of those factors contribute to women not actually engaging in the topic as individuals. Now, when we look at women in um, civil society organizations, Several civil society organizations deal with women's issues, but not with macroeconomic issues. So we find that there is a gap in that area because it's perceived as technical, it's perceived as complicated. Um, the, the trading system is a spaghetti bowl of documents and agreements, which are difficult to understand. So understandably, a lot of people shy away from those documents. And I think that's why Feminet has taken this position to really engage with the macroeconomic issues and with the trade issues that affect women and really dissect and try to understand where exactly are the cracks and try to advocate in that area. Um, in terms of the first question relating to e-commerce, <clears throat> my understanding is that the e-commerce agreements under the ACFTA are supposed to take place in the third round of um in the third round but because of the current covid situation sorry i just remembered the interpreters <laughs> because of the current covid situation a lot of trade has um shifted to physical from physical trade and people going into stores to online um, transactions through e-commerce on, on various on, um, online platforms. So because of that, there's an increased need for the e-commerce um, debates or negotiations to take place. How this will roll out is still to be seen. But I do know that there are some countries that have taken a lead even outside of the trade agreements framework by providing domestic regulations that try to, to maximize at least um, in terms of revenue collection from e-commerce, for example, South Africa, which taxes at a certain threshold um, companies like Amazon. But this has not been seen across the whole of Africa. So this is definitely something that needs to be taken into account. So how this also has a bearing on women is that although women can engage in e-commerce, there is a digital um, gap and there is a data gap between men and women where men in households tend to have more access to digital devices. They have more access to data, which means that they will have more access to e-commerce activities uh, or to engage in e-commerce. Um, and so that excludes women. And we've seen that playing out in the context of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's not a, a challenge that's going to go away immediately. That's still going to take some time. And I know that there are various other factors, but I'll stop here um, in the interest of time. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Michelle, um, and that expansion. And I think it, it also brings me further, even as we hear comments um, from the chat, um, how... For example, Pauline says, it seems to me that the continent is just not ready on all on almost all fronts for the CFTA. Nothing has been put in place. No policy measures have been considered at the national level other than the traders looking to trade. No infrastructure, pretty much nothing. So I think it brings us back the question of this CFTA. Are we ready? Do we really know what we are getting into? Will it really help us? And especially, will it really help the women traders? Um, and I think that brings me also to a question, which now I'll pose this to Labila, as you've been able to expound to us further in terms of the situation with street vendors in Uganda. Um, do you feel like if I, which I don't know, correct us um, if we're wrong, if there are any regulatory bodies which have already been put in place to help the street vendors? Um, and if at all it's already there, do you actually think that within the trading scope of street vendors in Uganda, they have a position or rather the CFTA has, is in a position to be able to actually help street vendors, not only in Uganda, but in Africa? Um, I believe most of the market is also based and highly um, reliant on street vendors. Um, or is this something that we can do from a governance perspective nationally within different countries? Or is it now we are waiting for the CFTA to come and, you know, help us within that space? Just your thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Hola, thank you. Yes, oh, thanks.
Uh, sorry, Labila, we can't hear you. Uh, participants. Uh, sorry, Labila, could you come again? Uh, you broke up a bit. Yes. Once we identify. Uh, Labila, I think we, I think we lost Labila there. Um, but I think um, the question over and above, of course, are uh, hearing from Labila. Are you with us? Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Labila? Oh. Yes, we can hear you now. Can you hear us? Oh, no. Labila? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, as I was taking it off uh, from, from where you stopped about whether to, to wait for the um, for the um, for it to kickstart, I think that will be late. Uh, one of the entry points we have now as an as an entry point is to identify and bring out those nurses at the moment now when and make it uh, known to also the policymakers because also the street vendors, as I told you, they're really invisible. And one of their campaigns is to make them visible. So much as we're organizing the street vendors into, into unions to have one voice and to speak one language, uh, they don't have uh, that, that, that chair at that decision-making table. Uh, what, what the authorities are now doing is to create, to develop bylaws by which they can be governed and by which they can coexist with the, with the, with the regulated um, vendors that are in the shops or in the in, in formal markets that have been gazetted by Sorry, Labila, we're losing you. Uh, sorry, Labila, we're losing you. Um, sorry, Labila. Our offers us at the moment is to find how best we can leverage on it and create synergies with our and, and I type, I type, I don't know what's happening. But. Yes, yeah, just go ahead and type. Um, I think in the essence of time as well, um, because we'd like to take on uh, some few questions as you come to a close of our session today. Um, I think, um, as Labila was just talking about synergies and just seeing in terms of um, opportunities for us to be able to come together within the economic space. Um, I'd throw back this question to the presenters um, and panelists in terms of um, why, how we can bridge the gap between trade liberalization and gender inequality. How do we bridge the gap on that? And I think this question could go to um, Fatima, Michelle, or Labila, feel free to answer on the chat. Uh, anyone can come in, Fatima. Oh, sure. Sorry, I thought you were not. <laughs> you wanted us to answer on the chat. Um, oh, bridging, yeah. <laughs> bridging the gap between trade liberalisation and gender inequality. Well, this is the million-dollar question, to be honest with you. Um, and I think what I first of all want to just state for the record is that the idea of economic integration, which does include an element of liberalisation, 
is not something that I'm against from a Pan-African feminist perspective, because um, I think there can be a confusion around that. This is more about what the CFTA, um, what the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as a model is proposing. I spoke about the time frame initially. Um, I spoke about the cart being before the horse. So has everything been put into place in advance of tariffs being dropped? Um, and the preparation needed for that. Now, somebody has uh, commented regarding the um, uh, implementation strategies that have been prepared by UNECA. And within that, there has been a very strong focus on women. Um, now, one aspect of that for me that's a little bit problematic is that a lot of the focus has been on looking at women primarily as producers. So when we think about Michelle's presentation in terms of the way trade affects women across different aspects of their lives as consumers, etc., cetera, um, it doesn't really go into that level of detail either. So it's not taking a holistic view to what trade actually does. It's looking at that very instrumentalist view of how women can contribute to the success of this. Um, but questions around labor rights, questions around decent work, you know, questions around actually removing the gendered segregation of labor that will mean women are not doing, you know, brain numbing, hard, underpaid jobs, but actually get given an opportunity, for example, to fly within the services sector, which will be expanding quite rapidly in the next 10 years. Um, that hasn't been answered by some of those uh, papers, in my view, from my review of them. The other aspect of it is not all countries on the continent have those. So, you know, when I'm trying to answer this broader question regarding the gap, there are so many things that would need to happen before we start to liberalize at this level. I think the rapidity of the CFTA liberalization is just, to be perfectly frank, insane. Um, and I don't, I'm, I'm trying to understand why it has to happen within that time frame. This is the question that I need to understand. I want our countries to trade freely within each other. I also want there to be a very clear political solidarity between those countries regarding the investment that they're going to be soliciting from abroad, regarding other trade agreements that are happening bilaterally, such as Kenya signing trade agreements with the UK and the US, Cote d'Ivoire, as well as Ghana, also now looking at trade agreements with the UK because the UK is no longer part of the EU from the beginning of next year. You know, what is the policy of political solidarity in terms of how you deal with each of these external nations as well? I don't know if that conversation is being had. So for me, that gap is immense at the moment because all of this has an impact on women's livelihoods. Um, and until we start having those conversations from a political perspective, actually, this idea that, you know, get the economy right first and then we'll look at political development. I think that's nonsense. Um, I think it has to be actually, if not the other way around, and at least alongside and that's not what's happening right now so um i haven't really answered the question because i think there isn't an answer at the moment i think what we just need to be clear on is the way liberalization has been put forward globally in the last 30 to 40 years has been far too rapid and far too much in the interests of um, large corporations private sector and not for those who are the most marginalized in our countries and i think we can see the evidence of that um, across the world, actually. Uh, thank you, Fatima, for that. Uh, Michelle, would you like to come in? Michelle? Um, sorry, Nicole, I'm here. Okay. Um, I think I'll just echo on what Fatima has said, but perhaps uh, from a slightly different angle that there's been a strong uh, neoliberal narrative, which I think has been problematic. And I, one of my biggest concerns is that um, the African continent of free trade agreement and the entire framework around it is going to continue to pursue the same narrative and create the same problems or the same challenges that we have seen with, within the existing system. So, how that can be fixed, definitely, as Fatima has said, it's it's not simply an issue of fixing the economy. The political context has to be considered, but even within that, the inclusion of women's voices, and, and I think that has not been done sufficiently so far. Thanks, that's uh, that's my contribution. Yes, um, Michelle, that, that's um, very, very 
Interesting. Um, I can see a comment from Nancy Kachingwe, and she says that um, trade liberalization always, always benefits those which uh, those with stronger market power the most. This is a fact. And I think also just uh, to build on Nancy's comment, we talk about, of course, power imbalances within trade. These are so real, and it's something that we cannot deny. So when you talk about power imbalances, um, there've been talks that it's so difficult to negotiate for a fair trade agreement with countries that finance almost 50% of your um, national budgets of other countries. So what's, what's your take on this, um, just based on that comment in terms of power imbalances? and within trade and how different countries are different levels is the cft actually going to be beneficial to all from a from a neutral level or this is something which will benefit other states than others and if that's the case that um, countries which are less developed will not necessarily feel the fruits of the cfta as some other countries how do we get to a position to have much more inclusivity and balance on that. Um, and that question is open to all facilitators. So whoever would like to take it on, uh, please feel free. Yes, uh, Nico? Yes, Labila? I think now I'm clear. Uh, I've changed the gadget. Yes. Uh, of Yes, uh, one point that is frustrating was that it's African community markets, the common market, because all the member countries feel like we're at different stages of development. Then some are still live flogging. The other, like, we are far ahead of you. We, we cannot tap into our economy. So the same will happen at the continental level with, with the African um, trade, trade agreement. And also the ministry, yes, the political power is not yet uh, bold enough to take those steps and they'll still go around um, resource mobilization issues of capacity. Uh, but what we have to do as um, feminists is to, to engage or to work alongside with um, with that woman at the last mile. I'll give them their... Um, um, amplify their voices and let them talk these issues uh, themselves. Because also I think the policymakers are getting used to civil society noises of, uh, about each and everything. But if we change the paradigm and shift it to the women themselves, those who are most affected to raise these issues at the national level, it will make a transformation at at the national level, which will translate in at the national level. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Labila. Uh, back to the question on, or in addition uh, to the question of power imbalances, how fair is fair um, when we say we have the African continental free trade area? Um, that was the question just to clarify for you, Michelle. Um, thanks a lot, Nicole. I actually also just want to touch on a comment that's been um, added by Nilanjana Mukia, I yes. think, um, speaking to the issue of the race to the bottom. I think this is because trade and investment are so intricately connected. This is going to be one of the challenges or one of the bigger challenges that we will have on the continent. Um, in terms of the flooding of um, investors in order to benefit um, from this agreement. So if you really look at it closely, you'll find that there are some countries that have stronger um, regulatory frameworks because again of their economic power and also because of their political stance um, on the global sphere, for example, South Africa, which has perhaps slightly stronger protections um, for the local producers or the, or the domestic markets in comparison to other investment agreements that you find across the African continent. 
So because of that economic power that they hold and the political power that it holds, it has a stronger position to negotiate. It has a, it has stronger bargaining power. And due to that strong bargaining power, I think we're going to see with the implement or the rolling out of the of the ACFTA that the countries that are that have stronger economies already on the African continent, like uh, Nigeria, like South Africa, they will they would continue to have a strong position, provided um, you know they they all have signed in. But what I'm trying to say at the end of the day is that the fairness in a neo in a neoliberal system is difficult to actually reach. It's a system. It's a, a capitalist system where business has profit motive as the main objective. It's a system where um, it's survival of the fittest. So the, the fittest and the strongest now will, would continue to be the strongest in the new system. It perpetuates those inequalities. Um, and that's my opinion. So in terms of how fair is fair, it's really difficult to find um, in the current system because the current system is based on on the mainstream economic thought, which is neoliberalism. And there hasn't really been, I think only in recent years, they've started being um, alternative voices or alternative theories surfacing to the forefront. So because of that, you can't, I can't really say there will be a fair, fair system because what is fair for one will always be to the disadvantage of another in a neoliberal system. I hope um. that makes sense. Yes, yes, uh, that's very, very clear. Um, Fatima, would you like to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to agree with everything that Michelle <laughs> said there fundamentally. Um, and just to kind of let people know that one thing that has been mooted as part of this is a regional integration fund. Now the EU has one of these and the idea is that the wealthier countries would put money into um, a pot that would help with those adjustment costs that I mentioned. So the fact that some countries are going to have you know, losses in certain sectors as a result of jobs being lost, as a result of imports coming in and competing um, heavily with existing commodities that have been produced um, you know, or in home territory, et cetera. But even within that, um, there is a power relationship. So, you know, the countries that we've already mentioned, such as Nigeria, such as South Africa, the biggest GDP contributors, but also those with, the, uh, with better negotiating power within the agreement itself, they will likely be the contributors. And as we can see with the EU, there is still a hierarchy of nations. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we're looking at the EU potentially as kind of where we want to be, I think we should just hold on a second, right? Because that's not necessarily the case. There is a hierarchy of nations, even within the EU, which had a similar fund. And when there is a crisis, and you know, the pandemic is not the only one, let's go back to the to the financial crisis. When there is a crisis, as what happened in 2008, we will see certain countries that suffer the most being demonized, as happened to Spain, to Portugal, to Greece, and to Ireland, um, because they were more harshly hit, and they were seen to be bringing the continent down. And those countries that are stronger within the EU um, were essentially the saviors, but also that power relationship was then reinforced, that unequal power relationship was reinforced. So again, this brings it back to the politics, you know, of solidarity and the very idea of pan-Africanism, which is supposed to be underpinning this. I just want us to really have that conversation. And I just feel it's not being had in any genuine, meaningful way. I am a Nigerian, so my country is more likely to benefit from this. But that means absolutely nothing to me um, when I look across the continent and I see, you know, Zambia suffering, when I see Guinea suffering in the first 10 to 15 years in particular. And there's no guarantee also that in 15 or 20 years that this inequality would have leveled out. So I think we really need to look at that um, in, in, in a lot more detail. And women's voices are critical as part of answering that question. Yes, true indeed, true. Um, thank you so much for those insights, um, Fatima, Labila, uh, Michelle. And now as we come to a close of our session, I can still see some questions coming in, but unfortunately we are time bad. Um, in terms of our session today here at uh, GSWF 2020. So um, just in terms of uh, closing, I think the last question or maybe what I would say as closing 
uh, remarks from each of our panelists is just um, existing opportunities for feminists to engage uh, with the CFTA processes so that we can ensure that um, this sort of, you know, a, a consensus within the continent for us to be fully prepared. If at all there's something we can do, what opportunities are there for us to engage um, with the uh, continental free trade area. Even as now we see that um, the WTA is looking to have the first female leader. Um, this is something which we are really excited of uh, about and also, but as also we look at it, uh, what does that mean? Does it mean with uh, Madam Ngozi possibly coming in that the inequalities are now um, going, you know, to be something which can possibly reduce over the years or as Michelle mentioned, we are in a neoliberal, you know, uh, situation. Is it going to be entrenched um, as neoliberal? If at all, is there anything we can do? So just in terms of feminist engagement, um, what are your last points on how we can get into that space, get active, advocate um, within gender and trade? So I'll first start with um, Michelle, then I'll go to Fatima and then close off with Labila. Just two points as we close off our session today. Thanks again, Nicole. I think the, the one thing that I would um, probably advocate for is a human rights based approach to trade and to try and find um, entry points to lobby for that and to challenge that. Um, just to give an example, a few, I think a few months back, there was a challenge with um, a foreign investor going into a national reserve and over exploiting the area. Mm -hmm. And through social media, people were able to get recourse and people were able to reverse the government decision. So I think we need to maximize um, whichever spaces we find ourselves in, whether it's going to be social media or academic papers or online platforms, whatever it is, to speak about it and to put this information out into the public. A lot of people have no idea what this agreement is and what it's about. They have seen the name, but they're not interested because they don't know what it is. So I think it's up to us to, to continue sharing this message and to continue highlighting the challenges so that people can stand up against the problematic areas and we can work on building the agreement so that it, it actually works in a way that is beneficial to both men and women and to all countries in Africa. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, over to you, Fatima. So yeah, I mean, to be honest, my two points included, the one that Michelle has just mentioned regarding disseminating the messages. Um, you know, if you go to YouTube, you will find sort of two minute videos on what the CFTA is that have been prepared by UNCTAD and a variety of other organizations. And, you know, it's largely pro, um, but also to a certain extent neutral. What we need are similar uh sort of uh, we need similar modalities for getting this information out there we need to take the core essential messages and break them down so that more people can understand and put them in those spaces um the next thing i would say is actually very similar to uh, a comment that has already been put up here by one of our participants um nancy kachingwe Sorry, there's a bit of feedback there, so I hope you can still hear me. So Nancy actually talks about what this means for domesticate, domesticating the CFTA at the national level. And I will say that actually this is where we need to be engaged more than anything else. Um, so even though there are regional spaces where conversations are having and we need women's voices in those spaces as much as possible, it's actually at the national level where we need to be doing the majority of our work, whilst also working across borders as women's rights organisations feminist activists to um, to keep our messages on track and to have that solidarity at least among ourselves in terms of really getting to the bottom of what this agreement is going to mean for um, our lives so yeah that would be my my second point let's start at the national level but keeping that pan-african um, position of, of solidarity so thank you to nancy for putting that on the chat as well uh, thanks a lot for highlighting that, Fatima. Um, so just getting from what you said, uh, Michelle, and you as well, we need to be able to dissemination of um, gender and trade, and as well as starting from a national level and working our way up with pretty much Ubuntu. Um, Labila, would you like to come in with some comments on that and your recommendations? Yes, uh, 
the other recommendations say for what has been stated could be identifying the champions at the national level, the decision makers and preach the gospel to them through a feminist lens, because without them, we can't walk not very far. Uh, this will also require movement building because there's um, magic in numbers. When we, when we are collective, I believe in the collective change can happen. So uh, having those champions at the national level, that are feminists, pro-feminists. Those will be our entry points. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Labila, Fatima, and Michelle. And also to my co-moderator who had some challenges, Memory Kachambwa, thank you so much um, for coming today for this session. I have put a link on the chat, which is the gender and trade e-learning um, information from ongta.org. So you can go ahead and we'll be able to engage more within um, the gender and trade um, with the knowledge um, on the link that I've shared. Once again, to the participants, thank you so much for making time to, for joining our session today. We look forward to possibly coming together and you know meeting you in person should we have the GSWF 2021. Hopefully COVID will not be on our way next year and we can be able to come together as feminists in, in person. So once again from Femnet, um, this is not goodbye. This is just farewell because we'll be seeing each other within this space. Thank you for attending today's session. Have a lovely evening. In Kenyan time, it's now going to 6 p.m. So yes, have a lovely evening. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.